Okay, we're going to start a new topic today, diffusion. And we talked about diffusion earlier in the class uh, when we talked about the transfer of carbon dioxide from the air to the water and back and forth. Um, but we're going to talk about, it's, it's a much more general process um, with a lot of applications um, in the earth sciences and outside the earth sciences. Um, so let's define it first. So, so diffusion is the net movement of anything. And oftentimes um, we're talking about atoms or energy It could be anything, it could be ideas. Um, from regions of, and this isn't always the case, so usually, so it's usually um, net movement of, of stuff from regions of high, higher, A lower concentration. And that sort of movement with without bulk motion. So for example, water flowing down a river um, is bulk motion. So that, that's a different that's a different way of transferring um, uh, stuff. So for diffusion, we're talking about um, uh, the, the sum uh, total of, of, all, of a bunch of random little motions, for example, of atoms or of thermal energy and how, how that um, uh, allows the movement. The movement. So we're going to focus on heat diffusion as one example. And the principles uh, of heat diffusion apply to many other situations. It's the same formulas. Um, so heat fusion and heat diffusion, another word for that is conduction. So that might give you a sense of, of what I what's meant by this definition, right? You put a, a cold pan on a burner on your stove and that, that energy moves um, from the burner into the, into the pan and then into whatever you're cooking. Um, and it does that without, you know, you don't move any, you don't move the pan anymore or anything like that. It's just that somehow the, the, the energy flows from one thing to the other um, from places of higher concentration. So that would be the hotter, um, uh, burner into the colder pan. So heat diffusion or conduction is one of three principal modes of heat transfer. And we've already talked about one other. So that's in addition to radiative transfer. And then the other is convection. And that's that's the the so the, the bulk motion variety of heat transfer. And for, let's see, so heat diffusion is one of the primary modes, or it's the primary mode of, of heat transfer. In solids, in liquids,
with high viscosity. So for example, um, water has a relatively low viscosity, so when you put it in the pan on the stove, the water starts to move, right? You, there's, you, see it, you see it bubbling up, you see it kind of swirling around. That's convection. So if we, um, if we had a, um, a, li a liquid, you know, the difference would be a solid, right? If you had something, if you had a brick in your pan, um, it doesn't move around, right? The heat somehow moves through it. Um, and liquids that are, that are very viscous, that don't move easily, um, also heat moves through them through diffusion. So I said this earlier, but heat diffusion is a good example of diffusion in general. And so some of those, some, some examples, um, so we talked about the, the transfer of CO2 between oceans and water. Um, so these are these are more these are examples of diffusion in general, right? Um, the the movement of of uh, of that CO two in the water itself, right? Um, other examples in earth science would be cooling of magmas. Metamorphism, so when when some hot body of rock moves into an area and heats it up, and then these examples go into uh, other fields, of course, so like biology. So maybe um, when 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 you breathe in oxygen, and somehow it's absorbed into your lungs. That's there's a diffusion process of the of the oxygen moving through into the cells from um, areas where there's a higher concentration into your body. Um, there's applications in physics and chemistry. It's a very, it's a very um, rich field. Um, even things like uh, public health. So for example, a disease, uh, a new, a new disease is introduced. A lot, these sort of models and, and equations and ways of thinking about um, how molecules move around uh, it works the same way for for how diseases spread. Um, same thing with with finance. So like ideas about um, how much something is worth, or the price of something, um, spread out in in the population. Okay, so lots of lots of reasons to 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 want to understand this basic process um, in more detail. So we're going to focus on heat. So let's let's just review. So heat is thermal energy. Has units of energy, of course. We've talked about uh, the joule before. Um, and I like to think about okay, if I if I was if I was stranded on a desert island and I wanted to remember the units of the joule. Like what? What does a joule break down into in in in, in base units? Um, so just remembering that that energy and work. So work being uh, sorry, energy being the the capacity to do work. So um, one of those little formulas I happen to remember: um, work equals force times distance. 
um, and I might for have forgotten, um, I think force has a unit of a Newton or something like that, which might be hard to remember, but also remember force, F equals MA, right? Force equals mass times acceleration. So, so, so work or energy has, so mass is a kilogram, acceleration meters per second squared, and then distance is in meters again. So a joule is kilogram meters squared per second squared. Okay, of course, um, heat is not the same thing as temperature. And heat and temperature are related, of course, so, so we're going to be using specific heat. The term, this is a, is a concept that's going to, a term that's going to show up in equations. Um, C sub P, so specific heat. What is that? It's the it's the ratio of heat added to temperature change per mass unit. So this has um, units of joules per Kelvin per kilogram. Okay, yeah, so if we add heat to something, um, a certain amount of energy, right? Uh, some things are gonna change, their, their temperature is gonna change um, more than others. So the specific heat uh, describes that quality of um, substance. And this is different, so just a side note, this is not, um, this is different from heat capacity. So heat capacity is a very similar thing, um, but it's not uh, normalized per mass unit. Okay, so we want to use this, we're going to be using this sort of normalized um, concept, specific heat. Okay, so heat moves around. I'm going to talk about the flow of heat, or the flux of heat. So let's think back to that example of um, putting something cold next to something hot. So if we if we were to go to some to zoom into like a molecular level, we've got atoms moving around randomly, and the 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 the, the, the heat in there is expressed by the uh, oops, by the. Uh, amount of motion of these if they're if they're vibrating around bouncing around really fast it's it's there's a lot of energy in there it's, we, we call that high temperature um, uh, something like that has a high temperature and so imagine this so say over here we have we have uh, something that is relatively hot and it's separated by a wall or some kind of boundary um, and this could be this could just be like an imaginary uh, boundary um, but it separates the hot the hot air or the hot liquid from some material that isn't, there's not as much energy over there. 
So intuitively, we know like some of this energy is going to transfer um, from one side to the other. And we're going to refer to that um, as Q. So Q is a quantity of energy. And it'll be so some, some amount of joules. And the question is, is how, what, what determines the rate of, of, of transfer of, of heat energy? So how does the rate of heat transfer? And that, so that's going to be, you know, amount of energy per time. How does that depend on different different prop different factors here? So one would be one of these things would be okay well how thick how thick is this wall? We'll call that delta X. How big is how big is the area um, of this area where the where the the different temperature substances are juxtaposed? Um, how, how different is the temperature, right? So let's, let's say we have a temperature one and temperature two. Um, these are the, these are sort of the main things that, that, that probably matter. So let's say, so how does the rate of heat transfer depend on the area, uh, the change in temperature and the, in the thickness of that, that boundary. So we can we can actually uh, sort of think to sort of think this through and arrive at formula that is the proper one. So so the the rate of heat transfer it's going to be proportional to different things. So let's let's add a, a proportionality constant. So so k. It's gonna it's gonna depend on the the material that the wall is made of. So it's a material dependent uh, constant. We're gonna call thermal conductivity. Okay. So there's some. We'll get back to this in a moment. So this it's gonna be the rate of heat flow is going to depend on the, the properties of this. Maybe I'll, I'll just put a K there so we can remember it's a property of this, this wall. Okay. So let's think through this. If, so if we have a large area, everything else is the same. Um, are we going to have more or less, uh, heat be able to transfer through here? You could think of this like, um, uh, you had a very large burner and a very large pan, right? More energy is going to, is going to move through or into the pan, uh, if there's a bigger, bigger burner and a bigger pan. So, so a is going to be, uh, it's going to be, uh, in the numerator here, larger area, more heat flow. Um, how about how about the difference in temperature? You could think about this. If you put your hand, if you put your hand on a hot burner, you're going to get a lot of heat in your hand really fast, right? So the the, the difference in the temperature is also going to be in the numerator. Larger difference in temperature, um, more heat moving through, and. And if you think about the thickness of the wall, like if this, if this, if you put your hand on a burner, but you were wearing a really thick insulating 
glove, um, less heat's going to go through, right? So that's going to be in the denominator. So this this actually turned out to be um, so we've basically derived the the uh, something called Fick's law. Um, so this is. Fixed law, and one one more thing we can say about this K. Um, it has units of, and you can you can work out the units because you know the units of all these other things, area and temperature and so forth. So it, it has to have units of um, joule per second per meter per Kelvin. Um, which is the same, as you might remember, a joule per second is a watt. So it's a joule, uh, sorry, it's a watt per meter Kelvin. And it's also in the numerator. So uh, if, if it's larger, it's going to be larger for things that are very conductive. Um, so for example, um, for metal, it would be a lot larger than styrofoam. And we're going to be talking about uh, rocks because it's an earth science class. Um, so K is around 3 watts per meter Kelvin for granite. Okay, and, and Fick's Law is often written in a different form, in a differential form. Um, as dq, dt equals minus k. Okay. times the change in temperature or distance. And the minus sign uh, is because if you think about it, the 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 heat the heat moves in the opposite direction as the as the the, the temperature gradient. Okay, so because heat flows oops, so as so if you go from cold to hot um, so we normally, we, we, in terms of our scales for temperature, so cold might be zero and hot might be 100 or something, right? So we're increasing, but the heat flow is going the opposite direction. So we have, that's the reason for this negative sign there. So what this basically tells us is that the amount of heat that flows is proportional to the 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 thermal gradient, and there's some other some factors we need to consider like the material and um, the area. So, um, and units. So this is. second here um, so we this this can be rewritten as 
as a flux. So it's often written, written, written in terms of heat flux. which uh, we use the letter J. And, and, and in this class, we're just going to be thinking about it basically in one, one direction, one dimension. Um, you'll just say X for now. Um, in reality, of course, it's a three-dimensional problem, but we'll just keep it simple here. So heat flux is... The amount of heat uh, per time per area. So we just move the area over and we have the terms we saw before. So we've um, we talked we talked about a heat flux earlier. I mean, the solar flux is a heat flux and it's it's also per square meter, right? So this uh, heat flux as units of watts per meter squared. When we were talking about the solar flux, though, we were talking about the, the radiative heat, whereas we're talking here about a diffusive heat transfer, but the same with a lot of similarities and comparisons. So. Let's look at the heat flux at the Earth's surface coming up from below. Some, so we actually, uh, geologists often use different units because these numbers are so small. So we use milliwatts meter squared. So there's, or there's a thousand milliwatts in a watt, of course. And so the ocean floor has varies, all these vary, but something like a hundred milliwatts per meter squared. Uh, the ocean ridge, so that's where we're new magma is coming up um, can be quite a bit higher hotter or I shouldn't say it can be hotter but that's not what we're talking about we're talking about heat flux so those are different things so more heat moving up though will tend to make things hotter and on the continents varies quite a bit but averages around 58 milliwatts per meter squared And just for comparison, you might recall the solar flux was 1,373 watts per meter squared. So um, that dwarfs, if we do this in milliwatts, it it dwarfs the, the, you know, the heat that's coming out of the ground, right, by a factor of something like uh, 10,000 or more. So let's, I'm just going to ask uh, a question for you to think about here. Um, the question is, is the temperature increase per kilometer? So if we drill down, um, in, an, in an ocean, if we drill a hole in the, in the crust of the ocean, is it larger? Or smaller. Than beneath continents.
Okay, so this question might seem like it's coming a little bit out of left field, but let's think let's think back about this equation that we worked out. Um, we said that the the amount of heat uh, per time per area, so you know, the magnitude of this of this arrow, depends on the change in temperature. So how how what the difference in temperature is across from one, one place to another. And then I told you some heat fluxes. So people have put out sensors and determined um, how, much, how much energy is, is coming up uh, through, through the crust, right? So, that's, so they've, measured, they've measured this. And, we, and so we could say, okay, well, if this is large, if the heat flux is large, on the oceans it's the largest of these. Um, so that means that the temperature gradient is also largest. Okay, so the answer here is um, larger. And what that means is um, if we were to go down, if we were to travel down a kilometer under the ocean, we would get to a higher temperature than we would if we were to travel a kilometer down in the continents. And actually, this 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 principle is so so well established and um, so clearly defined that often we arrive at these numbers by measuring that we just go down and we measure temperature at different different depths and we calculate these um, heat flows based on that. So we could go a step further and ask. Um, well, how much? So, how much does the temperature increase per kilometer? Um, in or under, let's say, under the ocean. Okay, so I'd ask you to pause the video and see if you can calculate this based on the material I've presented. Okay, so in the ocean, uh, we have, let's, let's get our formula out here. So we're, we're interested in this um, change in temperature per kilometer. We have a value here of 100, 100 milliwatts per meter squared. That's our, our flux. Um, and that's going to equal minus k times the change in temperature with distance. And let's just use, we, we were given a value of k for, for granite, the typical rock. So three watts per meter per Kelvin. Negative three watts per meter per Kelvin times dt dx. Um, so we should be able to solve this to t dx equals 100 milliwatts per meter squared divided by minus 3 watts per meter Kelvin. And we have milliwatts and watts, so we gotta, we got to deal with that. So there's, just looking here, I want to get rid of, let's get rid of the milliwatts. So there's a thousand of those per watt. And then our units will cancel, milliwatts or watts. Um, one of these meters. And we have uh, minus 33 and a third um, Kelvin degrees 
per meter. So if we were to go, uh, oh wait, and sorry, divide by, divided by a thousand. However, we were asked about kilometers. So there are, if we look at the, the, the units here, meters, there's a thousand meters in one kilometer, right? So we don't actually have to worry about this a thousand. It cancels with that one. The meters cancel and we have minus 33 and a third uh, Kelvin per kilometer. So if we were to go down um, a kilometer, it would be around 33 degrees warmer than it was uh, at, the, at the base of the ocean. 